Oh, welcome once again to Virtual Church. Great to have you with us. We've got a lot of ground to cover uh, in today's service as we follow the Apostle Paul on his exciting adventures with his team around the eastern edge of the Roman Empire. So let's not hang about but press on without further ado. So last time Paul had come back chapter 14 from his missionary journey to Cyprus and parts of what is now Turkey, reported back to his sending church in Antioch, that great hub church that did so much to send out people and build up the expanding life of the, the early church. Chapter 15, there's some bits we've already touched on uh, about checking out the gospel. If you go back a few virtual church services, you'll find it there, the council at Jerusalem and those sort of things. Paul making sure that what he's got is the authentic gospel as taught by Jesus to his first apostles. At the end of chapter 15, we find Paul and Barnabas who'd gone out on that first missionary journey concerned about the new churches they had founded and thinking it's time to go out and visit them. So that's chapter, sorry, verse 36 of chapter 15. Barnabas wants to take John, but Paul doesn't. This is John Mark, who had left them in the course of their first minute, minute, uh, missionary journey and returned home. We don't know why, the Bible doesn't tell us. Anyway, they disagree very sharply about this, it says. And Paul decides to go one way, choosing Silas to be on his team, because he always went with the team, and Barnabas goes back to Cyprus with Mark. I personally like this, because in my own efforts to uh, be a minister for the gospel, I find that God so often works through my weakness and my failings. Clearly, it was is God's best that we love each other, that we forgive each other, and that we're reconciled to each other. But even when we don't manage to do even that for him, he can still use it. So I'm sure he used Barnabas and Mark back in Cyprus, and Paul and Silas, we will see how he uses them as they pursue uh, the other part of their mission back to the regions of Turkey where they'd been before. Uh, and we actually find that they were reconciled later because we find Paul writing to the Christians in Colossae uh, to say to them, this is chapter 4 of Colossians verse 10, uh, that they're to welcome Mark and be kind to him and, and remember that he's Barnabas's, um, his nephew. So, on they go. That's their mission, to go back to where they've been before to encourage people. They go back to Lystra and Derby, for example, where, if you'll remember the story, Paul and Barnabas have been mistaken for Zeus and Hermes. And uh, it's that, that, uh, there that they meet up with someone called Timothy. You'll later find uh, in the New Testament that Paul writes to Timothy, sends him two letters, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, to uh, instruct Timothy. Paul becomes a sort of mentor to Timothy. He's trying to train up Timothy for Christian leadership. So he becomes a sort of disciple, discipler of Timothy, passing on how to be a Christian leader. Some scholars say that since Paul's letters to Timothy have a different style. They must be very uh, must be by a different author. I don't actually hold that as somebody who studied literature. I wouldn't expect someone who is writing to a personal friend and a colleague to use the same style or to write about the same sort of things that they would write addressing a much larger group of people, such as a church. So I think that that's entirely in keeping with the sort of things that you want to write to a personal friend and colleague compared to uh, a larger group of people. So anyway, they take Timothy with, with them. So Paul, Silas and Timothy are now the team. 
and they go on from town to town on this limited mission. The mission is simply to encourage and build up the new churches that they planted, but the Holy Spirit won't let them do it. Yes, they do go to Lystra and Derby. Yes, they travel through other regions, but they find they're kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word of God in the province of Asia. That's a province of Turkey at this stage, by the way. It's only later that the name Asia gets attached to an entire continent, continent at this time. It just means a small part of what we now call Turkey. So they try to go here. The spirit of Jesus won't let them do it. They try to go there, and it's the same. We don't, we're not told exactly how the Holy Spirit stopped them, but we're told that that is what the Holy Spirit was doing so, because that might have been their mission, but the Holy Spirit has other plans. And how often that happens to us in our walk with God, doesn't it? We want to do X, but the Holy Spirit has another plan and wants us to do Y. Are we listening? Are we ready to go with what the Holy Spirit says? Or do we have to subject everything to our wisdom and our ideas about what is best? They end up in Troas, a port on the seashore facing west. And during the night, Paul has a vision. This is now chapter 16, verse 9. A vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that, gospel, that God had called us, us to preach the gospel to them. What does this tell us? The we and the us tell us that Luke has now joined Paul's team. Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, and also the writer of Acts, as you'll see if you look at the beginning of the book of Acts in chapter 1, verse 1 and following. So Paul now has a team of four. It's Paul, Silas, Timothy and Luke. Two Jews, Paul and Silas, two Gentiles, Timothy and Luke. And that's a really important thing at this particular juncture because they're, when they cross over, that little bit of sea between them and Macedonia, they're crossing into Europe. We're now looking at the story of how the gospel first comes to Europe and therefore comes down to us. So it talks about how they put out to sea, how they end up in Philippi, named after Philip, who was the father of Alexander the Great, Philip the King of Macedonia. So it's a very important town, and again and again, actually, we find Paul coming to the central towns, the capitals of areas, because he wants the gospel to spread throughout the entire region. If he'd come to England, he'd have come to London to try and make sure that the gospel spreads throughout. If he'd gone to Wales, he'd have gone to Cardiff, or if he'd gone to Scotland, he'd have gone to Edinburgh the leading cities, because he wants the gospel to radiate out to the entire land. So there they are in Philippi. Uh, verse 13 tells us that they went down to the riverside. There wasn't a synagogue there, that tells us. But there were some God-fearing people, and they gathered by a river to, um, to pray. So they were Gentiles, but They'd heard about this belief in one God, and they'd felt drawn to this one God. The God had spoken to Abraham and through Moses and through David and given an inheritance of faith. They sit down. That's what teachers did in those days. They didn't stand up to preach. They sat down and begin, began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. 
If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Now, this Lydia is an amazing person, I feel. First of all, she persuaded Paul and his team. Not many people could persuade his tour, it, persuade Paul when his mind was set another way. Barnabas certainly couldn't. Uh, and uh, nor could Peter with this dispute between Paul and Peter uh, about about the gospel to the for the Gentiles, and and uh, Paul seems to have won that one. Lydia could. This formidable woman was a dealer in purple cloth. This meant she was a wealthy woman because this was top stuff. Purple cloth. Purple was an extremely expensive dye, which was only available by crushing some fairly rare shellfish. The dye was literally worth its weight in gold because it was so hard to obtain and to produce. So a wealthy woman with a large house, not only does she have a large household who are baptized and saved uh, there by the river where they first met, but uh, she's quite happy to accommodate Paul and his team. Four blokes turn up, yeah, plenty of room in her house. This was how society was structured in those days. So when you read in some of the letters in the New Testament that, that they and their household, you know, send greetings to them, then uh, we're talking about a large establishment. There would have been colleagues, there would have been people working with her on her business. There would have been household servants who were part of the extended family <clears throat> and quite possibly other members of the household have just gathered in hospitality in that one big house. So where does the gospel to Europe start? It starts with a church plant in the house of Lydia. The first European church leader was a woman. Hmm. I think that says something, doesn't it, to the hierarchies of the church that were later established throughout Europe. Maybe uh, we should have listened a little bit more before having these men-only hierarchies to what was actually the story of the church in Europe and how God first planted it there in Lydia's home. Well, Paul and Silas continue to preach the word in Philippi. And as they go about doing this, a slave girl who's possessed by some kind of strange spirit, a fortune-telling spirit, follows them everywhere, shouting, Listen to these people, they're servants of the Most High God. They're, they're here to tell you how to be saved. Do you know, one of the things that brings a message into disrepute is the people who tell that message and the way it is told. And so having it told in the way they didn't want to announce it by this evil spirit is irksome to Paul and his team. So Paul rebukes the spirit, casts it out in the name of Jesus. The spirit leaves her. She's set free from this power that has hijacked her life. But her owners, because as a slave, She's just someone else's property, I'm not pleased at all. They earned a good deal of money from this fortune-telling spirit. They have Paul and Silas arrested. Don't know what's happened to Luke and Timothy uh, at this moment, but they pick out Paul and Silas as the ringleaders. The uh, authorities in the town, the magistrates, uh, have them beaten up because a crowd is joining in with the attack on Paul and Silas. And so whether it's to keep the peace or something, they feel they've got to take some sort of vengeance on Paul and Silas. Teach them a lesson to keep the peace. They're stripped, they're beaten, they're flogged, they're thrown into prison, they're put in the stocks in the innermost cell. Wow. So from this initial success in Europe, Paul and Silas are now in prison, uh, in the innermost cell, in the stocks. And of course, as you'd expect, they're terribly downhearted about it. Well, actually, no, they're not. 
they're praying, they're singing hymns to God. All the other prisoners are so amazed that people thrown into prison should be singing joyfully and giving thanks. What? Are they insane? What's happening? They're all listening intently. Verse 25 of chapter 16, and then suddenly there's a violent earthquake. The doors fly open. Everybody's chains are struck loose by God's power. The jailer decides to kill himself, probably not from a sense of honour, but much more because of what was done to people who failed in their duty in any way back then. They would face a much more horrible death than just a sword thrust. So he decides to kill himself, gets his sword out. Paul shouts out, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Verse 28. The jailer rushes in and falls trembling before Paul and Silas. He brings them out of their cell and asks, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That question that every Christian surely longs to be asked. But in these cynical days, of course, we hardly ever hear it. People don't even think that they need to be saved. And they explain, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and all your family. And they explain the gospel to him and to everyone else. So the jailer is uh, repentant. He washes their wounds. He is baptized on the spot. There didn't seem to be those long courses that we put people through nowadays. Uh, he brings them into his house, gives them a meal, and he's full of joy because he's come to believe in God. He knows he's forgiven. He knows that he's loved and his whole family is saved. Well, there's one more twist to this tale. The magistrates hope that a knight in, the, um, in jail, in the stocks, has taught Paul and Silas a lesson. So they say, can release them now. The crowd's gone away. Uh, it looks like things have settled down. We'll let them go. But Paul says... We're not going quietly. They beat us without a trial. They flogged us even though we're Roman citizens. They threw us into prison. And they want to shuffle us out by the back door. No. Let those magistrates come themselves and escort us out. So Paul is determined he's going to rub their faces in it. That they've misbehaved towards Roman citizens. Well, the magistrates of the city are alarmed when they hear that Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. They come to appease them and escort them from pris prisons and request them, no more ordering them about, because to put a Roman citizen into jail without any trial was against the law in the Roman Empire. They themselves, magistrates, have broken the law. They could face great trouble over them. So they request them as politely as they can to leave the city. Paul and Silas go to Lydia's house. They meet with the new Christians there and encourage them. And then they move on to wherever God might be calling them. Uh, it's back to those times of Jesus' day, isn't it? Do you ever find reading the gospel that you think, whatever next, you just didn't know what he might do next? You didn't know where he might go next, what he might say next. That was part of the excitement when there was no television uh, in those days of the gospel. And here we are again uh, in those exciting days as the word of, of Jesus spreads into a new area. Sometimes we don't see God's interventions uh, in as direct ways uh, at, at some times as we do at others. So maybe there were special clusters of miracles when the gospel was breaking new ground, getting into Europe for the first time, the early church being built up, or especially in Jesus' own ministry. We know that God does intervene. I've seen it. I know he does step in and act and answer prayer in amazing ways. But sometimes... Uh, we ask and ask, and it doesn't seem to happen for us. So what I'd like to conclude with is this. 
when we feel that we are in prison, when our circumstances, maybe the pandemic, maybe the loneliness that's so endemic in our society, maybe illness or something like that, holds us in bonds. The God who set Paul and Silas free is still with us. He promises, I am with you always to the end of the age. Even when he doesn't burst open the prison doors physically and set us free, he still is able to set us free in our hearts. So let's not read the state of our hearts according to our circumstances, but according to the presence of the Lord who loves us, with us, even in those circumstances. If we can lift up our hearts and do what Paul and Silas did, that still give thanks to God, worship him and praise him for his great love, even in our difficult times, we will find that we can be free on the inside. And that's the freedom above all that Jesus came to bring us, isn't it? Freedom within. May we pray. Lord, I, I don't know what my brothers and sisters who are watching this virtual church video are going through at the moment. I don't know in what ways they might be feeling imprisoned, trapped, maybe even feeling that you are far away from them. I just pray, Lord, whatever we are going through, that you will help us to know that you are with us. That you'll help us to hang on to the one who, in his love and presence, is our freedom. And help us, therefore, dear Lord, to know the liberty that you alone can give us in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so may that liberty be with you and set your soul singing in all circumstances until we meet again. Amen.